Hi, I'm Mike. Thanks for being part of my YouTube channel. I've taught chemistry, general chemistry, at the college level for 27 years. Now, thanks to some virus, I teach from home. But that just means there's more room for everybody to sit around the dining room table with me and talk general chemistry. I try to take all the subjects and strip them out into smaller pieces so that none of the videos that you watch will last longer than 20 minutes. And that's my promise to you or your money back. I can't make that promise, actually. Um, let's go talk uh, general chemistry right now. Well, hi, everybody. Hi, Mike here. I'm either your instructor for general chemistry 2, or maybe you just stumbled upon this video because you want to get ready for Gen Chem 2. Gen Chem 2 is a very difficult course. I'm here to help you succeed as much as possible and I think a lot of that has to do with getting ready before the course. First of all, you're going to need a textbook. If you're a student in my course, we use the OpenStax book, which is on OpenStax.org, the website. It's free. It's a download JPEG, or excuse me, a uh, PDF file. So even if you do have a textbook or you're on the fence about buying it, why don't you go check that out? Um, I'll show you a link right here. And, uh, you know, take a look. You'll see that they're mostly laid out about the same. Nonetheless, when you start Gen Chem 2, you're going to start in Chapter 10 of this book, and you'll have just finished gases. So, where to get started so that you're not lost? First of all, we got to kind of revive some of that old material that you have stuck in your noggin and it's been crusted over by everything over the summer or when you last took Gen Chem 1. So for some people, that's sometimes years ago. But the first thing I want to do is have you go back and review bonding. Or I'll do that with you today here. Bonding. We want to talk about the, well, if we'd be really simple, three kinds of bonding. All right? There is, well, really, let's break it into two things. Covalent. Sometimes the cooler, more in vogue term is molecular. Then there's ionic. Is it ringing bells? Great. So uh, there's a couple ways to look at this. Covalent is non-metal slash non-metal. Ionic is metal non-metal. Those are the two ways you can kind of think about those two kinds of bonding, all right? Now, there's another interpretation of what's covalent and what's ionic, and that is if you have an electro negativity difference that is less less than 2.0. Now, I do want to say this. There are sometimes different sorts of criteria. Some books will say this is an electronegativity difference less than 1.7. So, you know, there's not great agreement uh, for a number to be exact here. And uh, we'll say that ionic, I'm going to write out electronegativity. Yeah, I am. Difference. Oh my goodness. So, Ionic is going to be an electronegativity difference greater than 2.0. Now, tables of electronegativity are also different. So, folks, when you have 
a bunch of concepts in the scientific community, whoops, I just bumped the camera. When you have a bunch of concepts in the scientific community, there's not always perfect agreement, so just don't get too worried about it. So I'll show you some standard examples. And The reason we need to know about bonding is we're going to get right into this, right in the beginning of the course, and we're going to expect you to know covalent, molecular, and ionic right off the bat, and that's a, that's a struggle for some folks if they've had Gen Chem 2 a long time ago or they didn't feel very confident in it. But you can get off to a good start in Gen Chem 2 uh, if you just review these things. Usually it's chapter 7 and 8 of most textbooks. Uh, now, so for example, uh, covalent. Now I'm going to take carbon monoxide. That is an electronegativity of 2.5 for carbon. Oxygen's 3.5. So we would call that compound covalent or molecular. Table salt. Electronegativity for sodium in most tables you see will be 0.9. Chlorine, 3.0. And so you see you have a delta here. Let's just call it a delta. 1.0. That qualifies as covalent. Uh, or molecular. I, I say covalent more than I do molecular because molecular is kind of new. This is 2.1. So, what's the difference? This is actually electron transfer and that is a sodium ion and a chloride ion. They will swap electrons, so hopefully all this is ringing bells. And those actually have full-blown positive negative charges. Sometimes the charges are positive one, sometimes they're positive two. It could be a positive two and two negative ones. It could be uh, a positive, uh, two positive ones and a negative two. It could be twos and threes. So you probably recognize or, or have been traumatized by all that in Gen Chem 1. All right? So now a subset of covalent is this idea of polar and nonpolar. So this is where we're going to start right off with Gen Chem, the, the Gen Chem 2. These are both, you know, we'll call these both covalent. Nonpolar covalent. So what's the difference between these two? Polar covalent, what you've got is an electronegativity difference of greater than 0.5 and less than 2.0. Like carbon monoxide, what goes on here, if you draw the Lewis structure of carbon monoxide, there's a triple bond there. Now, if, another thing, folks, if, if you want to kind of hit Gen Chem 2 running, go review or watch my video on Lewis structures, which is on my Gen Chem 1 playlist. And there's about three, four different videos on that. But it turns out that this is a linear uh, compound. It's, it's got two domains. And what happens here is that the electron cloud is always skewed towards the element with greater electronegativity. So let's draw, let's draw an electron cloud here. Right. And because oxygen has a higher electronegativity, that side of the molecule is going to be partially negative and the other side is going to be partially positive. And then the criteria for polar covalent is can you cut the molecule somewhere where you can separate the charges? So uh, nonpolar covalent would be what if I took and replaced one of those, uh, let's say I take the carbon and replace it with another oxygen. Lewis structure for that. We'll let you look at Lewis structures on your own. The electron cloud there would be equally distributed and no side of the molecule is sort of hogging the blanket of the electron cloud. And so you have no real charges here. So what you got is you got three kinds of classes of compounds. You've got ionic where they're full-blown positive and negative charges. You got polar covalent where they're tiny partial charges and then nonpolar covalent. Why am I talking about this? Because Gen Chem 2 starts right off here. We're going to talk in our next video about inter between intermolecular forces. So what happens when a carbon monoxide comes up to another carbon monoxide? The 
slight charges that are created. Let's turn one of these guys around here. You know, we'll see that that's a, another carbon monoxide molecule coming within proximity of another one because of course you know the molecules exist with other molecules there's never just one molecule there there's always and we're going to talk about right starting out uh, with Gen Chem 2 we're going to talk about intermolecular forces those would have if all things being equal uh, for example the temperature is equal they had an equal number amount of kinetic energy we'll get into that next video there would be a little bit stronger attraction between carbon monoxide molecules than there would be oxygen molecules where there aren't those charges. And so intermolecular forces is where you start Gen Chem 2 and intermolecular forces is where I see my students struggle. And that's because that foundation of the three general kinds of bonding is a little shaky. So I want you to go and kind of take a look. And now remember folks, it's easier to bring knowledge back than to acquire it for the first time. So go and shake those synapses up and take a look at the bonding part of your textbook which is usually you know chapter 8 and 9. Specifically polarity of molecules. Uh, there's other wrinkles here. Sometimes the compound can have polar bonds but is nonpolar overall, and that's where you have to have a knowledge of molecular geometry. So the one that kind of is uh, guilty of making people confused is, hey, that's got polar bonds, just like you told me, difference of electronegativity of 1.0. Yes, it has polar bonds, but if you were to look, there's no side Let's do what we did up here with these partial charges. There's no one side of the molecule which I can go and cut a line and separate. They call that charge separation. Separate positive from negative. So you're going to find out when you got a polar bond kind of on the end of a molecule, it's much more significant in its attraction for other molecules of its kind than if it was like buried in the middle of it. And so for that reason, uh, when we talk about intermolecular forces, there's actually two subsets of polar molecules and forces. And I'm going to leave that for next time. I don't want to overwhelm you too much today. But that's how I think... I can get you off to a good start in Gen Chem 2. So I'm hoping that, and, and I've used a flashy title for this video, like watch this before you take Gen Chem 2. And by the way, go check out the OpenStax book. It's, uh, it's free, you can download it, so if you haven't gotten your book from the bookstore yet, or uh, you can read off a screen well, it's, you're going to get off scot-free. And uh, that's a nonprofit organization. I don't, you know, have anything to do with them except for the fact that I really appreciate them giving students a break on the cost of their educational materials. So that, folks, is how I think you can get off to a good start in Gen Chem 2. So uh, hopefully I will see you back here for the next video where we will talk about intermolecular forces. And we will talk about dipole-dipole forces, which is polar, Hydrogen bonding, which is another form of polar. Uh, London forces, which is how nonpolar forces interact, uh, nonpolar molecules interact with each other. And then I'll throw in there ionic forces. So uh, that's coming. See, I told you. But uh, all right, welcome to Gen Chem 2, folks. You will survive it. And I'm Mike, and I'm out of here. See you next time.